And this has been a feature of the war on terror. Uh, as you know, I've argued in my last book, Casting Out, that when you have, uh, you know, you, you make a decision that certain people will not have rights. So if you're accused of terrorism, accused, <laughs> You will not have the right to know of what you're charged. You will not have the right to know the evidence against you. Once we accept those kinds of things in our law, what we have agreed is that we will accept little spaces of lawlessness. And we will accept two kinds of citizens, those who are in the law and those who are outside the law. And that has been a feature of the war on terror. But as my research on, on, on these little spaces of lawlessness shows, people come to accept this. Liberals accept this, not just conservatives. People come to accept the existence of this. And it's very interesting how. I have argued that they actually come to accept it through race, which is to say, if they can be made to believe that the people that are stuck in that lawless zone are not people like them, then it's easy, easy to accept. And what's the best technology for getting people to think that they're not like you? As Ovid Mercury said this, this morning, you know, the assumption that Aboriginal people are inferior, that's a great technology for creating those little lawless zones because, you know, it's hard to care. So it's important when you're thinking about how torture works to think about how, what seduces us into a world where torture is okay. Now, again, uh, Scary had, had uh, importantly observed that you have to stop torture from penetrating your consciousness. You know, because your first impulse would be that it's wrong, <laughs> and that it's bad, and you're killing another human being, you're destroying another human being. But if you can put something in the way that stops that from going directly to your brain, then you'll be able to live with it. So the story that has stopped us most is the belief that torture is necessary because we need to know whether a suspect has planted a bomb, you know, that, that scenario. 24 plays it out all the time. We have to torture them because they planted a bomb, they know where it is. This, of course, is not a realistic scenario at all, but hardly matters because that helps us to deal with the fact of torture. And, you know, we have other little devices. If we call people detainees or enemy combatants, and we don't have to think that they're prisoners with rights. If we call it abuse instead of torture, we don't have to worry about it that much. If we call it, you know, a little strong interrogation method, we don't have to worry about it. All of these things stops torture from, from penetrating our consciousness. So, I, I, you know, and some people have argued that uh, torture brings a kind of inner satisfaction if you think that it's revenge. But again, and they've argued this for the World Trade Center, but revenge on whom, for what? You know, that itself needs a kind of racial uh, analysis. So, I think we as Canadians have to think seriously about what is stopping torture from penetrating our consciousness. And my assumption is people are generally not evil. They're actually uncomfortable with, with violence and so on. And they'll all say they want peace. Practically everybody says they're a peace activist. You know, so what is actually happening here where it, where it stops people? I, I don't want, I had like pages and pages telling you about that torture in Afghanistan, but I'm going to trust that you have read the newspapers and you know that we actually knew a lot about what was going on in Afghanistan and we knew that torture was going on and that we put in place a structure that would make it possible for torture to go on. What we have to do is simply not report to the Red Cross who's there, not check on them, etc. And there's very ample evidence that we have done all of those things. This is not in doubt at all. But the big question is, why would Ottawa, and by extension us Canadians, remain indifferent to the torture of Afghan prisoners? Why would we in fact enable it? And I you know, was immediately tempted to answer that question by going back to the Somalia affair. Because that's when we did torture, we never called it torture. Even I didn't call it torture in my book, I called it peacekeeping violence which has a, a much, I realize now with hindsight, has a much different ring to it than torture. But torture is indeed what it was, except for the fact that they knew they weren't getting any information out of them. 
you know, so even the cover story was, was not part of it. So what did we do with the Somalia affair? I mean, that, it, you know, that occurred to a lot of uh, journalists recently as well. James Travis, uh, for instance, he offered the, the argument. I normally like what he argues, but this time it was, was sort of uh, kind of vague. He said, oh, well, you know, what Somalia taught us was that, you know, we don't really want to handle prisoners of war. We don't want to handle prisoners. We're not good at it. Well, I think you know something else is going on, and I'm, I'm probably a little closer to uh, Professor Amir Atiran, who says we wanted to torture, we wanted it to happen. So it's not simply that we're inefficient or you know unable to figure out how to hand over detainees and monitor them. We, we wanted it to happen. But if I go back to Somalia and I keep thinking about what in fact happened to us as a nation over that issue, probably many people, I don't know about this room, but most Canadians will not remember uh, Somalia as our Abu Ghraib. You know, the vast majority of Canadians will not remember that. We had, after all, the photos. We had the soldiers doing the torturing. Uh, and so on. We had all the features of this kind of violence, which is open. You know, Shadena Roan was tortured and 80 people heard his screams. So this is not happening in a little back room. This is like Abu Ghraib. It's sexualized. I won't go into those details. It's collective. Lots of people do it. It's authorized. And, you know, it's recorded. Lots of photos. This is our Abu Ghraib, but we don't remember it at the, as this. And why don't we remember it at this, as this? Because after all, we even had an inquiry into the torture. We called it prisoner abuse in, in Somalia. Well, we don't remember it because the story that blocked it from penetrating our consciousness was that our boys, and it was boys, are in, in, in the parlance of the, the people writing about it, had a really rough time there in Somalia because it's really hard trying to keep the peace with these kinds of warring tribes. It's a tough job. And you know, sometimes you get in, involved in doing things to keep the peace and keep order. Sometimes the only way you can do it is through force and life is tough. It was the heat and the dust, phrase I never forgot from the Somalia uh, inquiry. The heat and the dust in, in Balatwin. They were pushed to it. They had unscrupulous leaders, so we went that far. We accepted that there were unscrupulous leaders who, who provided poor leadership. But for the most part, at the end of the story, who was the hero of the story? We were. We nice Canadians who are so nice that when we go to a place like Africa, the evil overcomes us, and we can't control things, and bad things start happening. That's the story that is our official story of Somalia. That is why we don't remember it as our Abu Ghraib. And so my question is, is this what's going to happen around Afghanistan? Is this already happening around Afghanistan? And I think uh, there are a few indicators that it is. That whole uh, venture into Afghanistan has been uh, all dressed up in fully colonial clothing from the very beginning. It's not only the right-wing ideologues like Mark Stein who, who you know, kept saying what the Afghans need is colonizing. He at least was open about it. Other people sort of you know, would say what they need is saving, or specifically what the Afghans need. Uh, you know, we need to save Afghan women, for example. But the whole uh, project is marked, as some scholars have already shown, uh, I like uh, David Jeffress's uh, tone uh, and his phrase. We, we, sh we showed this kind of nostalgic hunger for national distinction. What are we doing in Afghanistan? We want to be show we're one of the, good, the, the big boys, <laughs> that we can play with the big boys. This kind of nostalgic hunger for national distinction. And this, this response, I would argue, is implicitly, if not explicitly, a colonial viewpoint. It is not anything to do with analyzing what's going on there, taking responsibility for your part in it, trying to figure out what would actually help you know, undo it. It's none of those things. It's the assumption that these people mess up their lives in incredible ways. We have to go sort them out. We're a good nation for sorting people out. And that's what we're doing there. And we'll do whatever it takes. 
You know, it's it can go from Rick Hillier's murderers and scumbags comment, you know, that we're there to, to catch murderers and scumbags, to, to the liberals who insist that, you know, we're there to, to save people. But at the bottom of it, Afghanistan is not a place that has a history, that has political factors that need to be figured out, that has a, a scenario in which we are implicated in a variety of ways. None of this is part of the equation. And so there's every indicator that we are responding to Afghanistan in the way that leads to torture, that leads to violence. Because, you know, violence is authorized against natives who won't stay in line, ask Aboriginal people. But if you look at the, what the political scientists are saying, it is, it is deplorable. I, I, I may be picking on, on Jana Stein and other people like that, but, you know, when you read their analysis of Afghanistan, their analysis amounts to one line. It's a country of warring tribes. End of story. Well, what I'm really concerned about is if that's the extent of your analysis, we're going to be pretty soon in Abu Ghraib or some version thereof. Uh, and so I, want, I wanted to ask us then to think about the fact that it is precisely through feelings that appear somewhat benign, self-congratulatory, but benign, you know, that we're nice people, good Canadians, we like to sort people out. It's precisely through that that we begin to walk a road where violence and lawlessness is authorized. I want to just end then by uh, sounding sort of even more of an, an ominous note. When you think about what torture is, uh, Edward uh, Suberatz has, has written a lovely article on what torture is and what torture does. He observed that torture must hide its primitive, bloody, and sacrificial brutality from society while at the same time making sure to exhibit itself as a public demonstration of power. Hide the blood, hide the gore, don't talk about the screams, but at the same time, perform the power that torture is. Perform the story so that we know who is disciplining whom. And I think that that perhaps in, in, in that uh, observation might be a piece of advice for us to look critically at what is present, which is a particular story, and what is absent from that story. So that, that uh, we could perhaps remember that torture destroys one world and puts in place another. It destroys the world of the tortured and puts in place the world of the torturer. Take that on every level you can possibly think of and ask yourselves, what is the world that torture has left us with, us, us Canadians? I, I just want to finally, one last point, and that is, I want to use a word in connection with torture that might be the opposite of torture. I want to ask, is torture providing the West with some sort of pleasure? Pleasure being the word, because, you know, my friend Anthony Farley has written a great, great article where he argues that white people take pleasure in the images of black men splayed against police cars. You know, that's why you have to kind of see it all the time on TV. <laughs> they take pleasure in the humiliation of black bodies, and it's a pleasure in one's own racial superiority. And I would like to ask whether or not that is what it, uh, torture is doing for us. And to get back to the child in the photo, I really want to ask who is taking pleasure in that? Who is feeling afraid from that? Who is feeling chilled? What are the emotions that are produced in that? And what are the ones that will endure over time? I, I, I will end by saying we need to refuse the social integration that torture promises. Really refuse it and not play at refusing it. And Rick had asked me in an email, I think he said, could you say something about peace in your talk? And at the end I will say, there is no peace in a racially ordered world. <laughs>